Hey, this is Michael Kramer. This is Sarah Nofke. Hey guys, this is Ernie Howard. Hey, this is Scott Moon, and you're listening to 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. There is a giveaway with this week's episode, but before I tell you about it, let me tell you about our two sponsors. First up is the Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. The Galactic Satori Chronicles, a thirst for revenge, sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancée's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. Projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, these aliens are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Asher bands together with a group of friends, and these four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam Aliens, Politics, and Murder Only the first one is new. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Vernon is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate, while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. The Galactic Story Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks and Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam can both be found on Amazon. Or just head on over to legendarium.com, check out the show notes for this episode, and in the show notes we will include a link where you can check out both of these books on Amazon and learn more about them and buy them if you would like to. And now for the giveaway that I was telling you about. This week our guest is author Lindsay Smith, and she's going to be giving away an ebook copy of her debut novel, Secret. And Serial Box is also going to throw in Season 1 of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold. That's the ebook copy with the audiobook of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold. What do you need to do in order to get registered? It's simple. Head on over to legendarium.com, find the show notes for this episode, and let us know in the show notes what was your favorite part of the interview. It's as simple as that. Now enjoy our interview with Lindsay Smith. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. This week, uh, actually, this the special episode we're doing, this is a Friday episode. Our guest is Lindsay Smith. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Preston. Yeah. I was looking forward to this one. Um, we were supposed to actually have this recorded, was it like a month ago, but you got sick, so... I did. I yeah. went to... Um, <laughs> awesome con here in dc and it was a super packed weekend super fun super stressful super sick afterwards so it took me a little while to get back into the swing of things so i appreciate you being understanding about that no problem yeah that's that's one of my goals is to go to one of these big con events sometime i think it would be so fun i've never been to one so that is on my bucket list of things to do so i'm a little jealous of you so Oh, yeah, it, it was definitely worth it. Nice. <laughs> you know, it took a while to catch up. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, do, do you ever have anybody at the con to dress up as any of your characters from your books? Um, I have not had any cosplayers. I have gotten ah. fan art from people, though, which is pretty awesome. Um, I, I get some just these incredibly talented, even like high schoolers and middle schoolers who read my books and bring me this amazing artwork. Um, and somebody even like wrote a musical theme based off of one of the characters in my first novel, Secret. So that was just that just floored me. I was so impressed with that. I've very very humbling experience as an author. That is awesome. Well, here at uh, Thirty Minute Author Interviews, we kind of like to start each episode uh, with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie. And I'm currently on a winning streak, so I'm hoping to keep that one alive. But <laughs> All we'll, right, see. Well, we'll see. We'll <laughs> see. <laughs> if you can, can you tell us two truths and a lie about yourself, and we'll see if I can keep this going. 
All right. Yeah, I went with a travel theme for this one. So, okay. okay. Number one, I once played viola in a Prague train station to make enough money to pay for my train fare. Number two, I once had a police escort at 120 miles an hour through Siberia in order to catch a plane. Number three, I once rode through the Tsukiji fish market in Tokyo at 30 miles an hour on the back of a forklift. So I've had some time. I've had today to kind of mull these over because um, you sent them because <laughs> you sent them back with the with the media kit. I still don't know which one's truth or lie, and I, I have read some interviews doing a little bit of research for this. So um, here's my thinking. My thinking okay. is number one is true. Um, number so I'm debating between two and three, and and the things that are throwing me is the rate of speed that you were traveling. In, in number two and three, <laughs> number one yeah, would pretty specific. <laughs> number two would be pretty fun um, and interesting to hear about this police escort at 120 to catch a plane. But then I started <laughs> thinking. I always overthink these, and so I don't know if a forklift can go 30 miles an hour. I've been on a forklift before, but I've never <laughs> like floored it to see how fast they can go. I'm going to say maybe you did ride through a fish market on a forklift but it wasn't at 30 miles an hour <laughs> okay well actually number one is the lie oh man. i've actually never been to prague even though that's where um, the witch who came in from the cold is set so wow, <laughs> wow. I, I have done those other things so um and they were both a little too exciting for my days but it worked out <laughs> so is there any interesting story on why you had to get a police escort to catch a plane um, yeah, this was actually when I was in high school. I was on a study abroad trip um, with with uh, my class to Russia, and one of the places we went was um, this tiny little town in the middle of Siberia, um, just beneath the Arctic Circle. Um, very, very cold. It was March, but it was, but that's still deep winter in Siberia terms, of course. Um, so our bus had broken down because of the cold, the one that was supposed to take us to the airport to fly back to Moscow. So <laughs> they somehow, I don't know what sort of, this was 90s, so I don't know what sort of bizarre Russian corruption bribery thing went on behind the scenes, but we ended up getting a police escort so that we could make our plane. Wow. <laughs> that is, wow. And at uh, 120 miles an hour, it was still about like a three and a half, four hour ride, too. Really? Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was quite a haul just to get to the nearest regional airport. So, yeah, that that was an adventure. So you were a good six hours away at normal people speed. <laughs> Yeah, I think we must have been. I mean, at that point, we might as well might as well have just ridden all the way back to Moscow. But whatever. right. <laughs> so, any s- story on why you were having to go so fast through a fish market <laughs> on a forklift? I don't know why we had to go that fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, when my husband and I went to our honeymoon in Japan, the very first night slash morning, we just could not sleep because we were so jet lagged. Um, So we got up super early because we've heard the Tokyo fish market um, is really something to experience if you're up at 4 a.m. in Tokyo for whatever reason, um, because you get to see the auctions, like for the tuna that they haul in, um, get to tour the whole area, and then have this really wonderful sushi for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So we went there, and we were completely lost. And so this guy just kind of motioned for us to hop onto the back of the forklift, and (laughs) We're just hanging on for dear life, and he is <laughs> gunning it through the fish market. Like, I mean, definitely faster than any golf cart I've ever seen go. I may not have been quite 30 miles an hour, but it seemed pretty close. That's funny. Wow. <laughs> but he just drove us from one end of the market to the other. <laughs> wow. Well, so now that we've learned that you uh, apparently have a need for speed, can you uh, <laughs> give my listeners uh, maybe a little author bio about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I've written several novels for young adults published through Macmillan. Um, The first is a duology called Secret and Scandal, and those are both spelled with a K, Secret with a K, Scandal with a K. Um, And those are YA books. They're set during the Cold War in 1960s Soviet Russia, um, and then also the U.S., and it's about groups of teenagers who have these psychic abilities who are being forced to use those powers to spy for the KGB during the space race. Um, and so that was my first series. I had so much fun writing it. And it, that's just kind of my passion is kind of Cold War history. And then also that fun paranormal, fantastical twist to things, which 
is also echoed in the series I write and I'm the showrunner for at Serial Box called The Witch Who Came In From The Cold. Um, so I, I run that show over at SerialBox.com, which is um, a platform for serialized fiction. And I think their idea is kind of to be like almost like a TV episode that you tune in once a week and you get a new chapter in the story. Um, it's very bingeable and hooky and exciting. Um, so I co-write that with Max Gladstone, Cassandra Rose Clark, and Ian Tregellis, and also some other guest authors. And that one's a load of fun to work on as well. Um, and then my most recent novel is set in Japan, conveniently enough, um, called A Darkly Beating Heart. And that's kind of this really dark, vengeful, um, time travel story about this girl who goes to Japan after a family tragedy, and she finds herself slipping back in time into Edo period Japan from the modern day. So she kind of has these dual mysteries going on in both the present and then in 1860s Japan that she has to sort out. So is The Darkly Beating Heart, is that one also considered YA as well? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Um, why, um, why YA? Is that just a genre that you have always enjoyed? Yeah, it is. Um, I really love reading it, and it's a lot of fun to write as well, just because even though, I mean, I mean, you look at other genres of literature, you've got science fiction and fantasy, you've got historical and contemporary and kind of more literary stuff. But in YA, you can write in all those different genres, and it's still considered YA. Um, so I love that kind of feeling of being able to hop around through these different styles. But then I also love the fact that YA, it's really about um, a character's identity and them coming to terms with who they want to be and who they want to become, really, um, and what sort of role they want to have in the world as they get to know themselves and find their place in it. And I just really like having that added level of tension and discovery, self self-awareness too that the character is kind of blooming into while they deal with whatever is going on in their world so i just that sort of story is super super compelling to me okay now was it uh was it hard to jump from doing ya to the witch who came in from the cold uh because i've never really pictured that as as a ya novel so was it kind of a jump from going from ya to that yeah, it is definitely different. Um, I would say the bulk of the characters in The Witch are probably in their 30s. We've got a couple in their 50s and 60s and some even older than that. Um, so it is it is a different feel. Um, but I think there's some of that crossover in the sense that the main character in Witch or one of the main characters is this um, CIA officer named Gabe Pritchard. And even though he's kind of an established figure and he's kind of gone through his career with the CIA, he's only just now discovering this whole magical witchy world that's living underneath the spy world that he knows very well. So there is still, still that sense of discovery and figuring out how he wants to use his powers and how he understands his place in this world and what he's going to do with it. Um, and I've known Max Gladstone for a while. Uh, we've been good writer from for some time and I've read all his work. I read a lot of um, adult sci-fi and fantasy as well. So in that sense, it was still fairly familiar to me, I think. Yeah, well, one thing I love about uh, the Serial Box, for, for, for those that haven't haven't listened to any of our, our past episodes, uh, we've had Max Gladstone and Ian Tregillis on. Um, but one thing I really enjoy about the Serial Box platform is with uh, you get chapters each week, but they're long chapters. Um, they're and, and when you get them, you get an you get the ebook version, and you also get the audiobook version. Um, and the audiobook version is is very well done, uh, very high quality, and um, and it's uh, I think all the I think all the chapters have been averaging about an hour and a half um, listening to was, and yeah, it's like a dollar nine is it like a dollar dollar ninety nine or a dollar fifty nine a week if you subscribe. So I mean you get <laughs> yeah you it, it's a great deal for a dollar fifty nine. Um, how did yeah, you get, how did you get introduced to Serial Box and this idea for the witch who came in from the cold? Um, I think it it was really because of kind of just from knowing Max and then also um, the Serial Box CEO Julian. Um, he had he's good friends with uh, the Macmillan marketing team, and they had just happened to give him a copy of my debut novel, Secret. And he thought, well, gosh, this sounds like somebody who would know a lot about the Cold War and have a lot of interest in fantasy stories as well. 
Um, so he and Max both kind of approached me with this idea that Max had kind of been bouncing around, just kind of this general idea of witches and spies. Um, so yeah, I worked with Max from there to kind of shape the whole world that witch takes place in. And it just built it out from there. And then we found our writing team. Um, and it's just really been a wonderful, wonderful experience so far. Yeah. And um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, Serial Box actually has an app for iOS and Android. And I have an Android. I have it on mine. And it's very easy to access everything on there. So um, it's definitely something to, to check out. Um, there's The Witch You Came In From The Cold. And there's some other serials on there as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's yeah. really a cool platform. Yeah, they're really building out almost kind of like a TV channel. They're building out their show list and they've got a ton of really great ones. I'm I'm really enjoying the new one, Geek Actually, which is a super super nerdy modern story, which very much appeals to my nerdy self. So <laughs> I think the next one I want to check out is Book Burners. Um I, and I know Max Gladstone does that as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's I think I think that might be the very first serial box series. So yeah. it's in its third season already. But yeah, it's fantastic. So one thing I was kind of curious about with The Witch Who Came In From The Cold is you have a guest author each season. Um, this season, or se- season two, was uh, Fran Wild, and then season yeah. one was Michael Swanwick. Is there any guest authors that you would that you have on your list as I would love to have these people come and write a couple episodes for us? Oh my gosh. Well, there are just so many fantasy authors that I love. Um, <laughs> gosh, um, Nora Jemison I pro- is probably number one on my list. I absolutely love her work. All her books are just phenomenal. Um, gosh, Charlie Jane Andrews would be really cool. Um, um, who else? Gosh, I, I'm, I was thrilled with Fran's work, so I'd love to have her back again. And Mike's work as well was also phenomenal. <laughs> that's really anybody who has that interest in um, our, our very bizarre little world that we've built. I'd be curious <laughs> at least to hear, you know, what their ideas are for it. Nothing else. Cause it's, it's definitely a different, different setting. For those listeners that might not know what the witch who came in from the cold is about. Can you kind of give them the non spoiler book blurb on what the witch who came in from the cold is about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it is, it's a cold war story. Um, very much a Jean Le Carré style spy thriller um, about these warring factions of CIA and KGB operatives working in Prague, which at the time is kind of this no man's land of the Cold War, because it's it's very much now part of the Soviet Union, but it's still right on the edge of the Western world. Um, so there's a lot of tension there. But on top of all that, there are these two warring factions of witches called the Consortium of Ice and the Acolytes of Flame. And they're competing basically for dominance over these magical ley lines that fuel all the magic throughout the world. Um, So Gabe, who I mentioned, he kind of gets drawn into this witching world against his will um, and kind of has to decide where his loyalties lie, especially when he finds himself having to work with a KGB operative who is also a witch named Tanya, and they have to kind of ally to stop the flame from un- undertaking this very dangerous ritual. So a lot of um, shifting loyalties. There's this bizarre matrix of spies and witches and who's on what side and which world. So, uh, um, so with the uh, with the witch, the witch who came in from the cold taking place during the Cold War. Um, are there? Did y'all throw in actual events from the Cold War into the story? Yeah, we did. We haven't gotten to play around with that too much because everything's kind of happening in this, happening in this really compressed timeline so far. Um, I think everything that's happened in the two seasons we've done so far has been over the course of the first half of 1970. But it is set um, immediately after the moon landing, immediately after um, the Soviet Union came in and took over uh, the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at the time and took control of it. So there is definitely some very real world events happening around them. Have y'all started um, writing season three yet? We haven't yet. I think we're running a little bit behind because of um, the omnibus that came out from Simon and Schuster recently of season one. Mm -hmm. Um, We've kind of been on a big promotional book with that, but I think we're going to be starting that very soon. Oh, nice. Do you know, is there a certain 
is there a certain number of seasons you see this going or are y'all just going to take this as as long as you can um i think i think we all kind of agreed that three to five is about the magic number um for shows at least that we've been invested in in the past um so we definitely have plans at least through season three with ideas to continue on to five if we are fortunate enough to get that opportunity um so it really kind of depends but definitely three is very much how we see the story of the minimum playing out. Okay. With the witch who came in from the cold taking place during the cold war and then secret also, doesn't it take place around the cold war as well? Yeah. Secret is set in 1963. Um, and then Witch is set in 1970. What is it about that time period that just draws you to writing in that time period? Well, so I always grew up very interested in Russian history and Russian culture. Um, I think my earliest memory is actually of the Berlin Wall coming down. So this idea that this whole society, in a sense, that had been closed off to us was now open again. Um, I just got really drawn into that. And I was fortunate enough to get to start learning the Russian language in middle school and high school and then carrying that on into college. Um, So I've always wanted to kind of dig deeper into the stories set in Russian history, especially Soviet history. Uh, and so that's just what I've been drawn to in storytelling. So, um, do you also watch a bunch of, uh, of those kind of Russian spy shows that, that come on every now and then on television? Oh, yeah. um, oh yes. Very varying, um, qualities, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for it. I love, I love the old school James Bond movies and then the Jean Le Carre stories, um, the Americans, I like it, but it stresses me out too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I do enjoy I at least like the idea. I'm glad it's a show that exists. I, maybe someday, um, if I'm not feeling as anxious, I can enjoy it more fully. But it's one of those very high-tense shows that I can't quite get into. There was one I really liked. Um, it wasn't set during the Cold War. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it was modern times, if I'm remembering right. I wanna, uh-huh. is, it, is it called Allegiant? Was it Allegiant? Allegiance. That sounds familiar. It was on for one season. It was about uh, the this guy that was uh, he is a uh, probably in his twenties in the in, in the in the show maybe, and he was getting uh-huh. in with the FBI, and then he finds out that his parents were spies for Russia, and so oh, really he wasn't and it was set sure. In modern times. Yeah, it was set in modern times. Oh wow. <laughs> I want to say it was called Allegiant, but it was only on for one season. I think they they either stopped it after the first season or uh-huh. they ended up stopped showing it on television during the first season. You had to finish it on the internet. Like I, I guess the ratings weren't as good. as It, it was such right. a good show. I'm, I'll have to look it up and uh, send it to you so you can <laughs> check it yeah. out because it was really good. Yeah, I'm going to have to. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um so when you were writing um, The Witch Who Came In From The Cold, you went from writing novels on your own to this group of five authors writing, is it five authors every season, writing The Witch Who yeah. Came In From The Cold. So what kind of changes did you have to make in your writing process going from your novels to a group novel? So with the biggest change... Um was being able to plan the story out in advance in a lot more detail than I had done with my books in the past. Um, I I was already kind of in the process of transitioning to more detailed outlines and this just kind of forced my hand because if you're going to be telling a story where you stop at one point and someone else has to pick it up at another point and you're writing it pretty much at the same time, they need to know what's going to happen in your story so that they aren't completely contradicting you. Right. Um, So as a group, we kind of, we sit down every, for a weekend, every year, we just get together. There's a ton of food. It's kind of excessive. Um, (laughs) We just sit in a room and just hash out how we want this next season to go. And people all kind of have their pet characters, their pet story threads, but hearing everyone else's ideas and seeing what the different writers are drawn to is so inspiring um, because they'll come up with something that I never would have thought of on my own. And I like to think that hopefully I'm doing the same too, of coming up with these ideas. And there's just so much creativity in that one room. It's really, really enthusiastic. I always come off of it very, very full and very, very excited to get to work um, because we're just bursting with these ideas. 
So, so that's, that's just been a great collaborative, a great collaborative process to have. So when you, um, so when y'all start writing the story, y'all actually, all the authors get together in one, one room to, to plot how y'all are going to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, just, wow. we keep in touch through Slack over the course of the year. Um, and we'll have Skype calls and stuff. Um, as we're writing the season, but to come together and hash out how we want that season to play out, we just all get together in the same physical location. People coming from, like, I think Ian's coming from New Mexico, Cassandra's coming from Houston. Um, we all get together in the same, usually the CEO's apartment. We just crash there and order a ton of food and figure everything out for about 14, 16 hours a day. Wow, that is awesome. That'd be so fun to just be able to fly on the wall to watch four or it five authors like, write a story. If it were any longer, yeah, if it were <laughs> any longer, it would be too much, but it's just the right amount to really figure everything out, and we stay <laughs> on task pretty well. Nice. Um, do you have an excerpt from uh, The Witch You Came in the Cold that you could read so people can kind of hear what it sounds like? Yeah, so I can read a passage actually from the very first episode in season one, um, and I actually co-wrote this episode with Max. He um, wrote the Gabe scenes, and then I wrote the Tanya scenes. So I'll read a brief Tanya scene. Um, she and her KGB and ICE um, cohort, Nadia, they're both spies and witches for the ICE. Um, they've been t- trailing this creature that was giving off a magical signature through the streets of Prague. So... Tanya and Nadia chanted, bathing the alleyway in shades of blue and gold, even as the construct lurched out of its bindings. The glow wormed into its, into its articulated stone joints. The eyes in the hollows on its head burned a hot white. It leaped once more for the roof line, where the terrified student, Angela, crouched. But they didn't relent, letting the ancient languages twist and flow. Then everything happened at once. Angela's scream, the sparks showering from the construct's joints, the flash of light that hit Tanya in the chest like a fist. Her hand ripped out of Nadia's and she tumbled backward into the heap of broken wooden pallets. Flecks of wiring and crystals sprayed across her lap, the creature's elemental components. They'd done it. They'd overloaded the construct with energy directed from the ley lines, more than it could possibly contain. It had been reduced to its base parts, all of the power its creators had stored within it unleashed in a single burst. As for the matter of just who had created it, well, she and Nadia would have to deal with that soon enough. Bliad, Nadia swore, heaving a chunk of rock off her arm. She was sprawled across the alley floor, her dark hair pulled beneath her. Tanya had to blink, had to blink a few times to clear the afterflash in her eyes to make sure it wasn't blood. What the devil was that thing, the girl screeched. Tanya and Nadia exchanged a look. I need to gather components, Nadia said, so we can track down the creators. Tanya sighed and climbed back up to the roof line with Angela, the student. As I was saying, you were a host. You were born attuned to a particular elemental and through some means have been activated. Your elemental has come home to roost, you could say. Tanya smiled darkly. Witches like me are able to use these elements for good, but there are witches who would use them for more sinister purposes too. And they would very much like to harvest this elemental from you. That can be found over at SerialBox.com. That's S E R I A L B O X dot com. Uh, you can get the app on the Google Play Store, iOS. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Get through the first two seasons, and then should be ready for season three whenever y'all y'all get that one out. Should be pretty soon now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's what I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you uh, kind of end up being? made the head of the story? Um, well, Julian and Max had brought kind of the barest of bones story idea to me. Um, and because of my kind of my background in Cold War history and my knowledge of Russian um, and then my experience also writing fantasy, they just asked me to kind of shape of it what I could and see if I could put together um, what we now call our series Bible, which is a whole bunch of information about the time period and atmosphere and setting and characters and story. Um, Almost like uh, setting up the pieces on the board for people to work from. So I took on that job because it sounded like such a really fun project. And I had tons of ideas, even just talking to them briefly about it. Um, So I was able to put that together and I guess impress them enough that they let me have 
um, creative control over things. So <laughs> the, <laughs> the role I basically serve, um, I basically just keep everybody on task, um, make sure as people turn in their outlines, make sure we've got a good continuity flow going. Um, it's kind of troubleshoot issues before they come up, before we go into write. And then as, I, as people turn in their episodes, I go through them, make sure we've kind of got that consistency going as well. And we aren't getting too off track. And then once I've gotten things where I'm satisfied with them, then we send it on to the editorial team to process. Oh, uh, okay. You had, did your traveling that you do help you in writing this story? Or is it a mixture of traveling, but also the history that you had studied? Um, it's very much a mix. Like I said, unfortunately, I have not gotten to go to Prague yet. So that's very high on my list now. <laughs> um, I, I know some of our team members have, I forget who exactly, but I'm not one of them, unfortunately. Um, but definitely the history background has helped me a lot with it. Um, but then I don't, I don't speak Czech. I don't know that language. Um, so it has just enough similarities to Russian to get me in trouble. <laughs> so I constantly am having to uh, follow up with people I know who do speak Czech to make sure that we're getting things right. Um, so you have written stories that take place in Prague, Russia, Japan, and the United States. So if you could travel to any one country just so you could write a story in that country, which one, where would you want to go? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love writing stories all the places I travel. So, I mean, Prague would be, um, traveling to the Czech Republic would be amazing. I would also love to go to Vienna. Um, I've been to Scotland before and I haven't gotten to write about it yet. So that would be fun. Oh, that'd be um, fun, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see Morocco and India as well. Um, and South Korea too. So those are all pretty high on my list. I just want to get out of the Southeast. <laughs> I haven't been out of the I haven't been out of the country. So, uh, oh my gosh, my uh, wife wants to go to Ireland. Um, that's been one of her dreams, and I told her that's fine. We can go to Ireland, but since we're going to be so close to England or Spain, we need to take an extra flight so I can watch a soccer oh, yeah. game. Because <laughs> yeah, if you're going to Ireland, you have to do Scotland and England as well. I think. Yeah, and I I just want to go to watch soccer because I'm a huge soccer fan. <laughs> so um, the crowds there over there are so amazing that I would love to just. Just get, you know, she can stay at the hotel because I don't want her to get crushed, but uh, <laughs> I'll risk it. So, <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten to go to a hockey game in Russia, and that was quite exciting. Oh, um, really? They just get really into it, and it's very different rule set from the NHL too, which was great. Oh, really? Um, so is yeah. it more is it more intense over there than it is over here? Um, I would say they're more aggressive just in the play style. That there's not as much of the fighting um, as you see in the NHL. So it's a little trade, a bit of a trade off. I don't know. Okay. How about the crowd wise? Are, are, are the crowds pretty into it over oh, there? Yes. Oh, <laughs> very. <laughs> Everybody's got their Baltica beer too that they're drinking. It's great. That's funny. Well, here at the legendarium and 30 minute author interviews, we kind of like to end the episode on a not so serious note. We're known for one question. And that question is <laughs> a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say? And why is he here? Um, and he says, Oh man, this century again. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a time traveling penguin from the future who has come back um, probably to steal our fashion. Chris, there we go. Sombreros. Um, he might grab some high heels on his way out too. Who knows? There, <laughs> that, now that would be a side a penguin in high heels. There we go. Never <laughs> seen anybody waddle in high heels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it can be done. It might. <laughs> um, well, before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or life that you would like to share with our listeners? Oh gosh. Um, if it's a writing advice, I'm, I'm good at that. I think I always tell people to read as widely as they can and think about it critically when they're reading, um, kind of look into the bones of the story and figure out, um, how, how the writer is making you feel a certain way or how they're structuring certain things to pull off a certain effect. Um, I think that's a very illuminating experience, but then also to, close your eyes when you draft and maybe not quite literally, but definitely in the sense that you're just not looking back and stressing about the imperfect words you've put behind you. Just keep moving forward. 
and you can worry about editing it once you've gotten it all out of you. Sounds good. Well, where can our listeners go if they'd like to learn more about you and your stories that you've written? Um, my website is lindsaysmith.net. That's Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Um, and then you can also find me pretty much on all social media forms like Twitter, or Tumblr, Instagram at Lindsay Smith, DC. I live in Washington, DC. So it's a useful designator because there's a lot of Lindsay Smiths. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, we will put links to everything over uh, in the show notes at legendarium.com. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30 minute author interviews. We appreciate it. Uh huh. And thank you so much for having me. It was great. It was. That is all the time that we have for this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you tune in on Wednesday for another great author interview. Don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you're going to find the giveaway where Lindsay Smith is giving away an ebook copy of her debut novel, Secret. And Serial Box is giving away Season 1 of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold. And while you're at the show notes, also check out our sponsors, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, and also Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam. Let them know that you heard about them right here on 30 Minute Author Interviews. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and wherever you like to listen to podcasts. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Third Scribe, Maggie Stewart Grant, and Nick Breaker. They're supporting 30-minute author interviews through Patreon. They are also receiving the Patreon-only podcast, 10 Questions With. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews for as little as a dollar a month. Until next time, stay legendary.